This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. The X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All hit radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back to the Exxon, everyone. My goodness. Twelve more shopping days until Christmas. Then what are you going to do, gang? Huh? No, you cannot go to the Quickie Mart at midnight on the 24th and expect that you'll be able to get your loved ones something. If you can find something in a Quickie Mart to give somebody as a Christmas gift. Man, you're cheaper than Scrooge. Come on. People that you love deserve the best, but the best is love, and a simple I love you, a hug. Christmas is a time for being together with family, friends, and all working together to make this a better place to live, this world of ours. If you'd like to send me an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, TV. And if you'd like to find out all about the great programming we have available for you 24-7, 365 on the network, all you have to do is go to www.xzbn.net. And of course, not only are we on XZBN Network, we're also on the Digital Satellite Network, the Digital Broadcast Network, the Wi-Fi Broadcast Network, and of course, our good friends at iHeartRadio. My guest this hour is a gentleman I've had the pleasure of having on the show before. His name is Jonathan Gray. Now, he is an international explorer, archaeologist, and author. He has traveled the world to gather data on ancient mysteries. He has penetrated some of the largely unexplored areas, including parts of the Amazon headwaters. Uh, Jonathan has also led expeditions to the bottom of the sea and to remote mountain and desert regions of the world. His teams have slept in ruins infested with scorpions, dived among sharks, and dodged terrorist bullets. He has authored 58 books, produced 60 DVDs, and is a guest on numerous international radio and television programs, including this one, The X-Zone. Jonathan Gray is in the beautiful land of New Zealand. Jonathan, welcome back to The X-Zone, and to you and your family, a very Merry Christmas. Thank you very much, Rob. Likewise to you. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, Jonathan, for the listeners who didn't have the pleasure of hearing you when you were on with us years ago, tell them uh, a little bit about yourself and and what got you involved in archaeology. Well, uh, Rob, um, I first got involved, I suppose, at the age of 10. Um, I I read an article in a popular magazine about the British explorer uh, Fawcett going Mm -hmm. down into the remote, unexplored Amazon jungle of South America and coming out with wild tales of a vine-choked city, uh, now uninhabited, but with all the huge stonework reaching up into the sky. And he tried to interest the British um, uh, scientific community to support him in an expedition, but they turned him down. And uh, so he went in with his son and he vanished, never to be seen again. And I thought, wow, 
would I like to go into that area and, and <laughs> see some of the things that he said he saw? And uh, Rob, as it turned out to be, that it was my first expedition was down uh, in eastern Ecuador in the unmapped parts of the Amazon where explorers were not going. So can I actually say that you are, in fact, the very first Indiana Jones? Well, I don't know about that, but uh, I have been called that a few times. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Is there really evidence of high civilizations that were in our past, and even with technology ahead of ours today? Yes, most definitely. Uh, In my uh, book, Dead Man's Secrets, I've actually um, documented more than a thousand uh, ancient secrets from, from the world before us. My gosh. And uh, that's just a that's just a sprinkling of what really is available to, to be studied. Um, but then, of those, um, I've found forty six of them which are way ahead of us in in our technology, where we haven't yet achieved. Uh, I guess a lot of the things we have achieved are just simply rediscoveries of what was lost. But they're still ahead of us in some ways. What are some? And, of... and I've documented that in a little book called Forty. 40 uh, 64 secrets ahead of us. So can you share with our audience some of these secrets where they were actually ahead of us technologically? Oh, yes, yes. I'm happy to do that. Um, well, you know, we, we pride ourselves in uh, being pretty smart, but um, uh, they, they did things a bit stronger than we could do them. For example, bronze, harder than we can make. Right, tin and harder copper. Than steel. Yep. Um, Now, bronze is a hard alloy made of copper with the addition of one-tenth part tin. Mm -hmm. And uh, the early Chinese, as well as the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land we now know as Israel, knew how to harden bronze to the strength of high-grade steel, harder than we can produce even today. And we still do not understand how they did it. Unbelievable. Well, there is some speculation that the... the, um the copper that they used for bronze was actually uh, found in North America, and it was brought from North America back to the producers of the bronze. Uh, is there any truth to this? Yes, yes, actually. Um, for example, I'll just mention Ecuador for a moment, because that's in the Americas, but in an Ecuador museum is an ancient steel-hard copper wheel, and that was found among one of the ruins of the old cities there. Now, numerous artifacts recovered from ancient mounds in uh, Michigan, USA, uh, were likewise made from mm-hmm. chilled, or shall I say hardened, copper by a method long lost to mankind. So, yes, they, they knew about it in the United States, what's now the United States, and there's good evidence that the ancient world, the old world, made visits to the USA. In fact, we've, uh, there are remains now which um, are, are quite extensive in, in different parts. Why is it, uh, Jonathan, and if anybody can help answer me this question, you are the man. So why is it that people today, the majority of people, think that the ancients could not have done any of the wonders they have done in the past? For example, the pyramids in Giza without extraterrestrial intervention. Well, I think, um, Rob, the, the, the trouble is that uh, a certain philosophy has taken over and uh, that has hijacked the, the education system from the kindergarten to the university and in the Western world. And that is the, the Darwinian theory that we were, our ancestors were all pretty dumb and we are still evolving upwards and that the scientists alive today are the brainiest who have ever lived. Now, to, to try to come against that, uh, we've got an entrenched um, system which has oodles of money, yeah. and if any professor uh, speaks up who, who, who just disagrees with it, he'll either be fired or he'll lose grants for, for a project he wants, or he has his reputation at stake because... After all, um, he's supposed to be teaching something, and if he doesn't teach it, he's in trouble. And this is getting through to the public, and the public accepts it as they don't realize a big cover-up is in in swing. So is that why children in schools today are still being taught that Christopher Columbus discovered the Americas instead of the ancients? 
Absolutely, yes. What a and shame. Th- and most people don't question, and it's time we started questioning these things because the evidence roars against it. So if there is so much knowledge in the past, Jonathan, then how could it have gotten lost over time? Uh, two ways, Rob. Uh, man-made disasters, man-made destruction mm-hmm. of man, uh, in other words, war, including nuclear war. Really? Uh, and I've stuck my neck out on that one, but I'm prepared to back it up. Okay. And the other one is natural disasters like earthquakes and, yeah. and all sorts of things like that. And, uh, of course, not only... D- we don't need to speculate because what we do have is oral, re- oral uh, legends of these things all mm-hmm. over the world. We also have written records describing such events that took place by, by some of the survivors. And we also have physical remains, and the, the three together form an unbreakable uh, chain of evidence. All right, you've, you've whet my appetite and my curiosity about the ancient nuclear warfare. Tell me about that. Okay. Now, there are, there are several uh, places in the world where uh, we have evidence that uh, this uh, event took place. We have uh, India, we have uh, the Middle East, mm-hmm. uh, and in fact, I suspect that we also have some evidence in, in parts of South America, but also in North America, closer to home. And uh, we could spend a lot of time on this, but uh, definitely uh, there are oral legends uh, in North America, and there are remains which do speak of the same event and um, uh, really uh, where where do we go from here it's quite a it's quite a big thing where would they have where have they have learned the technology to create a, a nuclear bomb or anything that could be used as a nuclear weapon well, I guess we could ask the same question for our, our science today. Where do we get it from? We get it by Trial patient and investigation and, and research. And it can be done by human beings and has always been possible to be done even by our ancestors. It would seem that what is, what is happening here is that we are just reinventing the world. You could say that. Wow. As a matter of fact, uh, one scientist has actually put it in writing and he said, could it be that uh, we are not the first, but that the, our ancient ancestors were able to do these things and we're only finding them again? That puts into a lot of questions some of the points that were written about in the Bible, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, the two cities that were destroyed. You know, uh, as Lot and his family were leaving of the uh, the area, the, Lot was told by the angels not to look back. And when his wife looked back, she turned into a pillar of salt, which could be interpreted into ash. So could this have been the very first documentation of nuclear warfare on this planet? Well, we, we, have, we certainly have evidence that Sodom and Gomorrah did exist. Yeah. In fact, I've, I've made expeditions into that. All right, why don't, why don't we do this, Jonathan? I've got to take a commercial break. I really love this topic. You're one of my favorite people. You're very, you know, I, I love having you on the show, and I thank you for taking time out of your, I know, very busy schedule to be with us tonight. So hold on, my friend. We'll be right back. Exo Nation, Jonathan Gray is our special guest. He's an international explorer, archaeologist, and author. His website is www.beforeus.com. That's www.beforeus.com. I'm Rob McConnell. This is the Exxon. Exxon at radiotv.com is my email address. And check us out on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, 
Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. All right, Exo Nation, Jonathan Gray is my special guest. He is an international explorer, archaeologist, and author. Jonathan has traveled the world to gather data on ancient mysteries. His website, www.beforeus.com. Jonathan, before we went to the commercial break, we were talking about you actually going to the site of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes. Actually, there were five cities uh, that were destroyed, uh, Sodom, Gomorrah, Zor, Admar, and Zebulun, the two largest being, or the first, the largest being Sodom, and but the best preserved one being Gomorrah, which is about 20 miles to the north of, of where the ruins of Sodom are. And um, it, it, as you as you go into the area, it mm-hmm. really is eerie. Um, it, it, the, the, it's almost like the smell of death is around. There's mm-hmm. nothing grows. Uh, no, 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 you can't survive there very long in the heat unless you... Uh, as a matter of fact, when I went in there, I had to keep getting into the shade every half hour because it was just so hot. Uh, it, it burns you up, and uh, I've known of people to have died within a few hours, not days, but hours in that particular region. So it's it's very close to the dead sea and and the dead is the right word not even fish live in the sea Uh, but it used to be like the garden of eden according to records lush and and fertile Mm -hmm. now uh, in that area you go in there and you see these white uh, shapes going up into the air and you can see the shapes of windows and and terraces and and pyramids and uh, the streets are, are flanked on both sides by these uh, these walls and uh, from them you see buildings rising, what's left of them and uh, it, it's quite an uncanny situation in fact my first night in Gomorrah um, I, I could hardly sleep um, I, I just waited for, for daylight to come back and as soon as daylight came boy it started roosting but uh, I've been back quite a few times and uh, uh, I, I was convinced that this was uh, the, the site, but I had to convince an unbelieving world. Mm. So I, I uttered a prayer to the Creator, and I said, look, if, if, if this is to be what I have to broadcast out and show to people, give me evidence. And just next time I went in, it had rained just a few hours before I went in. And rain, you might get rain just two or three times a year, but it had rained just a few hours before, and here... The rain had washed off from the ash all these little balls embedded into the sides of buildings and not into the ground, which had fallen. These were sulfur balls and brimstone balls, and uh, they, they were unique. I checked with the geologists elsewhere in the world, and others have done the same, and there is nothing like this anywhere in the world except on the ruined areas of these five cities. It's absolutely different from anything. It's not like what a volcano would leave behind. It's not like, actually, with respect, it's not even what a nuclear uh, thing would leave behind. It's unique. There's nothing like it except on these five locations. 
What is your spe- oil from the sky falling out of the sky, wow. burning everything up, and uh, turning everything to ash? It's just ash, and I've got sulphur balls right here beside me as I speak, Rob, uh, and. Uh, you can see the, the, the ash, which is part of some structure that uh, it, it came off. And uh, there embedded in the ash is a sulfur ball with a burn ring right around it. The burn ring is embedded in the surrounding ash. Has that phenomenon been found anywhere else in the world? Nowhere else in the world. Wow. And we've checked. With, well, I've been to volcanic sites mm-hmm. and, and so on, but no, there's nothing like it anywhere. There's an, I don't know of one site, and we've made a lot of inquiries right. to cover that ground pretty pretty well. Let me ask you this then, uh, Jonathan. The story about the biblical flood, is there any proof that such a flood really happened? Oh, I would say, well, first of all, legends. There yeah. are 600 legends around the world about this great flood, and they agree on most essential points, that it was global that there were a few survivors, that animals were taken into a boat along with other, with other provisions to last for long enough till it was over. Uh, that, now, this is in the legends of every race. In fact, it's the most widespread legend of mankind. So there's the oral traditions. Then we have written records which have come down to us from the Bible and from the Sumerian records and from other Chinese documents and, and others. Uh, which also agree with each other, uh, written records. But then you have uh, physical, and I love the physical better because, uh, you know, it's something you can touch, you you might be able to smell it, you can look at it. Uh, and uh, and this is where I spend a lot of my time, has been in documenting the evidence for this world-shaking event. Um, I, I could go on for ages on this one, but, uh, of course, what about the survival vessel? There have been lots of people claiming to have climbed Mount Ararat, which is in eastern Turkey, and said that they've seen things up there. And I have spent years checking out, and every one of them has has proved groundless. But there was one report, and that was not on Mount Ararat, but on the mountains of Ararat to the south. Now, it's interesting that the book of Genesis doesn't say Mount Ararat, and as a matter of fact, geologically speaking, Mount Ararat has, is a post-flood volcano. It's come up since. Fascinating. But, but the mountains of Ararat, mm-hmm. uh, there is a boat-shaped structure right up there, 6,000 feet above sea level. It, it was higher. Uh, the, the, the bottom of the boat, or what, what we call that, the bottom of the hull, mm-hmm. is embedded uh, another thousand feet higher up the mountain, but the rest of the of the vessel has come down in a mud flow, uh, or, or a volcanic mud flow, uh, and it rests there. And the Turkish government has built a visitor centre, and they've named the area the International Historical Noah's Ark Park. They call it Nuhun Gemisi, which is Turkish for Noah's boat. And wow. it's the same size mm-hmm. as given in the book of Genesis, 515 feet. Now, I'm talking about the, the, the uh, measurement that Moses used as right. he wrote it. And he used the Egyptian crew, but he was educated in Egypt, and his first readers were edu- educated in Egypt. They came out of Egypt. Right. And uh, he said 300, uh, 300 cubits, which translated into the Egyptian cubit into our measurement is 515 feet. And here it is. One and a half times longer than a football field. We've had scientists go up there. They've they've used radar. They've used uh, 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 iron tracking equipment and found a pattern of rivets, 4,300 rivets wow. holding it all together. And these rivets actually show sophisticated technology, including titanium, which we've only been able to use since the space age began. So they were able to do things. And uh, not only that, but uh, I personally held in my hand deck timber, uh, and uh, we've, we've taken samples of it to laboratories, and it's declared to be three-ply timber, but three-ply much thicker than in the three-ply that we use. Um, and this is, this is right through the structure. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the radar shows that there are three layers to this this vessel, 
and that the first two layers have collapsed partly upon the bottom layer. And there's a doorway in one side, about eight feet tall, and uh, we've been able to extract animal dung from inside it. Mm-hmm. So that this whole thing is ringing true. And uh, we go to records of the ancient Persians and the ancient Egyptians, and they actually give us, give us uh, what shall we say, north, south, east uh, uh, relationships. And both the, the, the Persian tomb of Darius and the Great Pyramid together form a pattern which focuses on Noah's Ark. They were both built in relation to where the location of Noah's Ark is, and it's spot on. So could we say then that the Great Pyramids were actually built to help coordinate the location of Noah's Ark? That is one function that they do fulfill. Mm -hmm. That may not have been the main purpose, but the location of it, yes. I'd say the location was, was put there because of its relationship. Fascinating, truly fascinating. The last time you were on the show years ago, you, you, you blew my mind away when you said that there were ancient remains, ancient Egyptians' remains, in the Grand Canyon. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Share that with our listeners, if you would. Okay, I'll, I'll be very happy to do that. Um, well, now, if we go back to the, the 1800s for the, the beginning of this story, mm-hmm. and uh, at this time, uh, the Smithsonian Institute had a scientist. Uh, his name was Kincaid, G.A. Kincaid, and he was working with Professor Jordan of the Smithsonian Institution, and uh, they went down the Grand Canyon and... They discovered a network of caverns artificially hewn into the side of the Grand Canyon. But the interesting thing is, um, they, they were actually going down in a boat looking for mineral. And some 42 miles up the river from uh, the El Tovar Crystal Canyon, they saw on the east wall of the Grand Canyon stains in the sedimentary formation about 2,000 feet above them. Now, there was no trail from down so far, but uh, it was evident that as they climbed up there, that there were steps leading from a height 2,000 feet above them from a wharf, from a quay, or or what what would you call it? A uh, A wharf. A a docking place for boats. Yeah. That means that the, the... that the level at the time these steps were made mm-hmm. was 2,000, the, the riverbed was 2,000 feet higher at that time, and since that time it has eroded its way down. So that, that shows a huge change in the canyon in just a few thousand years. But that also makes sense when put into, uh, put into a timeline of the Great Flood and then the, the, um, the trading of, of uh, copper to the places that use bronze. Absolutely. Yes, it it does, Rob. Now, they went into this this labyrinth of passages Mm -hmm. and hundreds of rooms radiating from a central point like spokes in a wheel. And the relics that they photographed by flashlight were astonishing. Uh, There were mummies. There were images. Right. There were artifacts of a high technology. Uh, There was a grey metal that resembled platinum. And everywhere he looked, hieroglyphics were to be seen. However, if you go to the... If you contact the Smithsonian Institute Mm -hmm. today and ask them about their supposed role in the Grand Canyon, you'll receive a polite, no-records-found reply. Why not? Why, why, Why are people so hell-bent on not getting the truth out there. Stand, stand by, my friend. You and I have to take our third uh, break. Exonation. Nation, Jonathan Gray is our special guest. Uh, it's always great having Jonathan on. He blows my mind every time he's on. And his website is www.beforeus.com. And uh, we'll both be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. <music>
This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the X-Zone Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. All right, Exonation. Now on this show, we talk about government cover-ups. We talk about conspiracies. We talk about ancient aliens. Well, I, I dispute them. I don't talk about them. And, and all the things that do not make sense, because there has to be a truth out there, a truth that many do not want to surface. And I believe what Jonathan Gray and I are discussing tonight are the real truths that people do not want to get out there. Because after all, what we're talking about is not part of academia. And if it's not part of academia, well, how can it be true? Well, we know academia has lied through its teeth for centuries because if it doesn't fit the static or the good old boys club, then it can't be true. Jonathan Gray is an international explorer, archaeologist, and author. He's traveled uh, the world to gather data on ancient mysteries. He has penetrated some largely unexplored areas, including parts of the Amazon headwaters. Jonathan also led expeditions to the bottom of the sea and remote mountains and desert regions of the world. His website is beforeus.com. And Jonathan, it just baffles my mind that these amazing facts, like we're not talking fiction here, we're talking facts, that these these magnificent and truly earth-shattering discoveries are not shared with the world by those who are supposed to be the head of academia to teach the world what the world is all about. That's true. That's true. We, we, it's, I, I believe, uh, Rob, this is a spiritual battle. Uh, it, it, it's not, not just an academic battle, mm-hmm. uh, but academia is caught up on, on, the, on one side and, the, and those who want the truth are caught up on the other side. Um, I have to ask you this question as well. You know, there are a lot of stories of people who are actually seeing flying dinosaurs. And are they really being seen today um, in different parts of the world? Like, or are these figments of people's imaginations? Oh, no, they're not. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, these reports have been going on for years. Uh, well, if, if we just go back into history a little bit, dinosaurs is a, a fairly modern name for what used to be called dragons. Ah, and okay. uh, it, it's recorded in Greek history that when Alexander the Great, was, his army was moving westward toward India, they came across a dragon and they were obliged to destroy it. And it was quite a battle because it was much bigger than them and... and but they, they, they bettered it. Now, this we, we talk about St. George and the, and the dragon and so on. These are legends with a, with a core of truth in them. I mean, we don't know whether how much has been embellished, but the mm-hmm. fact that dragons did exist, uh, uh, and these are, these are the same things we'd call dinosaurs today, 
uh, has, has been so right through historical times. Now, coming to our own day, uh, in the Amazon, and I can talk about this because I've been in the Amazon, and uh, the, the native people of some of the tribes in there talk about these huge animals three or four days' walk away from a certain river where you may be talking to them. They mm-hmm. say three or four days' walk further into the jungle. There are these huge animals with big, tall, long, thin necks that whose necks rise above the trees. Now, how on earth would these natives uh, make up a story like that unless they had some basis they'd seen something? Sounds like Jurassic now, Park. Yes, it does. And uh, in the Congo, in, in Africa, the same story has been coming out for years, and this is more accessible. Uh, and uh, so scientists actually have been into the area, and they've taken with them to show the native people uh, they've, they've said, well, they've taken pictures of elephants. Mm-hmm. No, it's not that. They've shown them pictures of giraffes. No, it's not that. They've shown them pictures of hippopotami and, and white rhinoceros. No, it's not that. Then they've shown them pictures of dinosaurs. That's it. That's what we're talking about. My That's goodness. what lives over there. So, so we've got consistency. In fact, a, a report is by one of these tribes said that they actually captured one, killed it, and ate it, and they all became very sick. About, around about 1900. My gosh. I've also heard stories that a large Egyptian a drowned army has been discovered under the sea. Is there any truth to that? Yes. Well, I'll tell you, Rob, I, that became one of my favorite uh, expeditions. Uh, I've been there several times since. But My goodness. Uh, I'd heard about, I'd heard the claims, and uh, of course, being a, a, a natural skeptic uh, on the surface, mm-hmm. a skeptic has two choices, Rob. Either he can mouth the objections of others, which is quite easy to do and costs nothing, yeah. or he can put his money where his mouth is and go and check it out and prove it one way or another. And that's in fairness to the a claim that's made by somebody else. And I took my own team, I, I had a, a, gir- a girl from Israel. Uh, Gilly, and I had a, 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 an international diver from London, and I had some others with me, and we went going. We went down to the location where this was claimed to be found, and went diving. And there, all across the seabed, we saw unusual shapes of coral. Now, coral can grow over metal. Uh, it doesn't grow on iron, uh, on uh, gold so well, but it, it does grow well, very well over iron and other things. But the interesting thing was this coral, as we looked down on it, was coral for sure. It was dead coral, okay. but it didn't look like coral because of the shape. It, it was shaped like chariot caps, the coral was, and it was shaped like wheels. And then there were skeletal parts of horses and men covered in coral. Well, we've brought these up. Some have been tested in, in, in uh, laboratories. Uh, in fact, one wheel, was that, or part of the wheel, was taken to the um, Director of Antiquities in Cairo, Dr. Ali Hassan, and uh, he was the antiquities man at the top. And he declared this was from the 1400s BC in, in our timing. And uh, so he was asked, how can you be so sure? I mean, he d- didn't even hesitate. He said, this is part of an o- eight-spoked wheel. And he says, the eight-spoked wheel uh, was not used except during that dynasty. And that, of course, corresponds with the time of Moses. So the dating can be dated by the, the number of spokes in the wheel. So it sounds to me, my friend, that... The Bible is more than a religious book, but it's also a historical book. Very historical. In fact, as an archaeologist, I can, I can say this without any successful fear of, of being contradicted, and that is, there is not one archaeological, I'm sorry, there's not one archaeological uh, discovery has been made that contradicts the stories of the, the Bible. Everything that can be checked archaeologically has checked out correctly. So archaeology itself has proven the Bible to be true. Yes, it has. Wow. 
Now, this to me uh, takes us into the benefits we can get in, in our actual living. When you get a person who is, um, who is uh, habitually truthful and you then find that person making, and you can check him out and find that he's not a liar, but he's always, you know, can be checked and found true, telling the truth, then when he says other things that you don't have access to really prove it one way or another, by uh, the laws of chance, and I don't think it is chance, it, it's, it's, it's a law uh, that doesn't change. A person who is habitually a truth teller does not start lying. And so when, when the Bible talks about these events of the past that took place, and archaeologists come into the picture and say, well, we'll check this out, we'll prove this or disprove this, and they come away shaking their heads and saying it's all true, then you can believe the other statements in the Bible which give us a guide for successful living, for example, uh, and, and prophetic events of the future, and uh, at least give it a chance. And rather than the sceptic being given uh, the benefit of the doubt, I'd rather give the doubt the benefit of the doubt to somebody whom you know uh, has mm -hmm. been proved habitually to be truthful. It's, it's, it's just unbelievable, truly unbelievable. Um, could it be a combination of academia and I, I don't know you, you would think that the the religious philosophies Christianity the, the Vatican and 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 all the other high areas of religion would want this information to get out why aren't they behind archaeology and getting this information out well they're the losers they're the losers for not doing it. Uh, I think that um, today there are there are many religions, Christian religions, mm -hmm. claiming to be, that do not follow the Bible exactly as the Bible uh, instructs them to. And it's embarrassing if this is pointed out to them. And I think it's easy for them just to shake their heads and say, "Oh, that's not important. Let's just get just let's love one another and, and, and forget the rest." Well, that kind of seems to be. <laughs> You know, and that uh, that that way of looking at things just doesn't make sense to me, you know. Uh, and, and yet, you know, I re I remember a hymn that I used to sing in in Sunday school. It says, "How do I know?" And the Bible tells me so. That's right. Yeah. And and that that's a, a song which is as true today as it ever was. I know. I know. It's just like the Bible itself. Like I, I am the the scribe of the McConnell clan, and I have and hold here with me at my home, in a safe, I might add, the family Bible that goes back so far back in in history that the binding and the cover are made of leather. Wow, that is an old one. Yeah, and and when I look at the current Bibles that are being sold, and I compare it to, to the Bible that I have in in my custody and, and care, it's totally different. The internal, the the, in, the inside of it's totally different. Yes, yes, yes. That's a sad, it's a sad commentary on what men have been doing over yeah. the last couple of hundred years. The changes have come about because there are certain things in there that some people don't like. Oh. So they, they, they cut out pieces and mm -hmm. they even add some bits in, in occasionally and pretend that this is the same as we used to have. Fortunately, however, it, it can be the, the truth can be traced because uh, uh, the, the Old Testament written in Hebrew mm -hmm. has, has survived in countries outside the control of the corruptors and uh, the... Um, the New Testament, written in Greek, has, has likewise been preserved. And we have two streams of manuscripts, or rather, shall I say, two classes of manuscripts, the corrupted and the uncorrupted. And the uncorrupted have been compared with, different, uh, with, with counterparts in other parts of the world uh, and found that there's no change has been made. And so they're called the majority text because it's only a minority who, that have been corrupted. And uh, you can actually determine what is the original by comparing the majority and saying, well, it's a slight scribal error here or something, but nothing deliberate. 
and uh, it is possible to get to the truth. But most people, unfortunately, today are, are reading corrupted Bibles, and what you the point you have made is absolutely correct. Jonathan, please stand by. We have to take our final break. Exxon Nation, Jonathan Gray is our special guest. Do yourself a favor. Please visit this website. Pass this website along to your friends, your family, your associates, your workers, and uh, you will not be sorry. www.beforeus.com. That's www.beforeus.com. I'll be back with Jonathan. Don't go away. The earth is under ever-increasing pressure from untenable lifestyles and growing populations. Yet, viable answers seem in short supply. What if I told you there's an ancient form that can empower you to take charge of your life? What if your entire family could be enfolded and supported by life itself, finding safe passage through challenging times? I'm Gwilda Wiecka, founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Art School with great news, an upcoming series of leading-edge online affordable classes based in an ancient form of shamanism easily learned and used by your entire family. Galactic Shamanism, Art of the Ancients, Key to Tomorrow are a series of online adult and children's lessons instructing your entire family on natural law, how to cooperate with and be supported by the powers of the universe. Visit findyourpathhome.com to find these unique and powerful classes. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. You know, Exonation, um, do you remember that show called The X-Files? Well, of course, everybody does, you know. I watched it to watch Scully. I didn't really give a darn for the other guy. What was his name? Oh, whatever his name was. Okay. So anyway, the truth is out there. That was on the poster on Agent Mulder's office wall. You know, the truth isn't out there. The truth is right here. Because if we cannot be truthful about our past, if we cannot be truthful about the ancient mysteries that that Jonathan Gray and other great explorers like him find and bring forth that gets lost in the academia bullcrap shuffle. How in the name of heaven will we ever understand or how can we ever believe anything we're told about anything else? Yes, like, good you know, question. It doesn't make sense to me, Jonathan. And explanation, I want you to visit this website, www.beforeus.com, and, and please share it because we're going to do our very best here to make sure everybody gets this website. And um, Jonathan, last month alone, there were 7.2 million copies of the X Chronicles newspaper that were downloaded around the world, and I'm going to make sure that you get a full-page ad in that newspaper. Well, thank you, Rob. I'm honored and privileged. So well, I certainly appreciate so, what you're saying. The truth needs to be get a, get out there, my friend. Uh, quick question for you. What about Atlantis? You know, people have come on the show. They've talked about Atlantis being here, there, and everywhere. What is your take on the fa- the fabled philosophical 
uh, Atlantean mystery. Yes. The interesting thing, Rob, is that the, the story of Atlantis, we, we never got it firsthand from the, the person that first told it. Plato. Uh, he, he was an Egyptian who told it. A, a Greek man picked it up. Mm-hmm. Uh, he handed it on to somebody else, and then from that person we got the story. Oh, so wait a minute, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. So it wasn't Plato who came up with this? He didn't, he didn't invent the story, no. Ah. It came from an Egyptian priest. Isn't that interesting? Because nobody talks about the Egyptian priest. All they say that this was a story that Plato came up with. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Plato passed it on, for sure, yes. The interesting thing about this story is that it has very great similarities with the world before the Great Flood. Now, uh, there, there are two options that, that we can take on this. First of all, we can say, okay, it's like the Great Flood. You, mm-hmm. you have the, the ten generations, and you, and you, have, the, uh, you have the high technology, and you have uh, water, uh, destruction by water and, and, and fire and so on mm-hmm. uh, coming up out, out of the earth, um, which is the same as what happened during the Flood. But uh, the other option is, was it just a local thing uh, like uh, an island in the eastern Mediterranean, and, and many people b- believe that was, was the origin of it, and that Atlantis was in the Mediterranean, not in the Atlantic. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, both of these have merits, but the time factor given for them is it doesn't make any sense. Uh, uh, I I'm uh, I lean toward the world before the flood, but uh, once again, I'm not going to be dogmatic about this. The, the story of Atlantis appears to me to be a garble of certain events that did take place mixed with things that did not take place. It's an interesting story, it, uh, and the seed of every story, uh, every legend, mm-hmm. uh, you have a kernel of truth in it. And I guess that's about as far as I'd like to make a stand because I prefer to have more evidence to to confirm something rather than just uh, have leave it open to two alternatives. www.beforeus.com is the website for our guest this hour, Jonathan Gray. Uh, Jonathan, time always goes so fast when you're with us. Uh, let me see here. Was the current Muslim invasion of Europe and America really predicted in detail over 2,500 years ago, as well as how it will end? Yes, yes, it certainly was. As a matter of fact, there are two books in the Bible that speak about the the, the events. Uh, There's one in the book of Revelation which talks about uh, the three woes that will come, and it has been fulfilled to the detail. Uh, in fact, the Muslims are admitting, they're saying, well, what the Bible says about the three woes, we call it the three jihads. Ah. And we're now in the period of the, of the uh, third woe, which uh, predicts, actually, that uh, there is going to be a huge Muslim invasion and that uh, the, the invasion will emanate from a caliphate uh, originating in Turkey... And uh, this links up with, with uh, the prophecy of Daniel chapter 11 as well, and that there will be an invasion of Jerusalem and that the caliphate will set up its seat of government for a brief period in Jerusalem with the aim of ruling the whole world. Now, that's in, that's in the prophecies. Now, the book of Joel is the most thorough uh, uh, report on the whole thing. It talks about the walls that are going to be built to keep them out, Don't we have walls being built uh, on the bottom of America and and also around countries of Europe to keep them out? Yep. But it says they will climb over the walls. And then it says they will rage in the streets and there'll be fire behind them and fire as as they progress through the streets. It says they will climb through the windows like thieves and and they will take over uh, houses. We find that people are reporting from Europe that they come home from work and here they are here are these Muslim invaders sitting inside their lounge room. Yeah. Uh, it's very graphic, very descriptive. So what I've done, uh, Rob, is I've produced a, a set of DVDs on, on the Muslim invasion, and uh, just well, the one DVD on the Muslim invasion, but a set of uh, four DVDs on um, 
uh, the, the the Vatican, Islam, and Jerusalem, because that goes into more detail and expands on the prophecies. But people who are, who are, are watching this are saying, "My, this is like." history being made but yeah. it was predicted so long ago exactly what we're seeing happen right now and these dvds are available on your website yes we're going to the same website Be- just on the top of the front page okay. uh, in in the little pink box there on the at the top left hand corner mm-hmm. there's a link to uh, ordering those dvds and exo nation you still have time you know, you can order these DVDs and tell your friends and family that they are going to be getting a set of DVDs from, or by, I should say by our guest of this hour, Jonathan Gray. Uh, and it's going to rock their world, just like the website at www.beforeus.com will. Jonathan, how do you see the world ending up based on the exploring you've done, based on the archaeology of the past based on your discoveries, where are we heading? We're heading into a new world order, Rob, uh, in which those who do not toe the line, those who do not become part of it, are going to be declared uh, not worthy of, of, of having a place in society, and there will be a death decree. Uh, in fact, many will be beheaded, but uh, the message is get out of the cities. And the Bible has this message sprinkled through it. Get out of the big cities, get a place in the country where you can grow your own food and not be dependent on on supermarkets, not be dependent upon uh, having to to get into a car if petrol becomes unavailable, Mm -hmm. not being dependent upon doctors. So learn some health rules and start getting ready to be self-supporting in a safe place, away from all the drama that's about to take place. That's the message is get out of the big cities, go to a safe country haven. Build your own. Get your own. And make sure there's plenty of water, because water is going to be important. Jonathan, we have about a minute and a half left. What is your final? What are your final thoughts, your, your words, to the listening audience of the Exo Nation around the world? I would say start reading your Bibles. Uh, realize that this is the Word of God. Man cannot tell the future nor is man uh, faultless in what he says. But this book has no faults in it. It's true, archaeologically true, historically true, prophetically true. We are now beginning to live uh, what was predicted, and uh, what was the, the past is now the present. Would you say what that... What was the future, rather, is now the present. Would you say, then, that we are actually in the times as written about in the book of Revelation? I absolutely do. Yes, I do. We're in the end times of man's control of this earth. My producer asked me to ask you a question, and it's very rare that he asks, so I'm going to, I'm going to allow it this time. But he would like to know what your outlook or your beliefs are about all these UFO sightings that are being seen around the world. Well, there are some man-made uh, sightings, uh, man-made uh, machines, mm-hmm. and our ancient world had had uh, what we might call UFOs, but right. they were all man-made. But there is also a demonic uh, presence in this because if you compare the claims of UFOs and, and and the phenomenon that takes place associated with them, they're identical to spiritualistic seances and the effect they have on people. Uh, and we are told that there are demons confined to this world who were cast out of heaven. And they are wanting to take over this world, and there's going to be a big final conflict. But uh, they are going to try to take over everybody, and that's part of the New World Order. They're behind it, too. Jonathan Gray, always a great pleasure and honor having you on the show, my friend. To you and your family, a very Merry Christmas and a love-filled spiritual 2018. And uh, we'll be in touch with you, and Exo Nation, you can... uh, in the, in the January edition of the X Chronicles newspaper, you'll be able to find out more about Jonathan as well as the great books and videos that you can buy at www.beforeus.com. Jonathan, take care of yourself, my friend. Blessings to you and all. Blessings to you, and may uh, your next year be a wonderful one, Rob. Thank you, my friend. Exo Nation, our guest this hour has been Jonathan Gray. His website is www.beforeus.com. Now, I'll be back on the other side of this break with the news at six and a half minutes past the top of the hour as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast.